Thank you very much. So thank you for inviting me to be part of today's forum. And it looks like it's shaping up to really be a dynamic discussion about environmental health and perinatal outcomes, neonatal outcomes, etc. So I'm going to focus today on the neonatal, but also the perinatal and a little bit of preconceptual health and uh, the role of endocrine disruptors. But in doing so, I wasn't sure where everyone's baseline knowledge was. I wasn't I understood that this was a very interdisciplinary group. So I am going to take a little bit of a fundamental approach to introduce some of the basic concepts of risk characterization as well as some fundamental definitions. So although a lot of this was already discussed by our first speaker, I think it, it always helps to go back to basics. So when we talk about endocrine disrupting chemicals, we're really focusing on chemicals or contaminants that in some way perturb the endocrine system. So essentially what we're looking at is something to do with hormones and some sort of perturbation of reproduction or developmental health. So as a consequence, we're interested in moms, we're interested in dads, but we're also interested in the development of the embryo, the fetus, and the neonate. So it's very difficult, when, when I first became aware of endocrine disruptors, I was working at the Institute of Population Health with uh, Daniel Kruski, and it was always, he always wanted to have a, a very straightforward list of a typical endocrine disruptor chemical, and a lot of the toxicologists that we worked with really were very reluctant to give a list. It's very difficult to say that um, this is the finite and sole list of chemicals, they cross biophysical and biochemical different types of characteristics. In many cases, outside of a perfect toxicological laboratory model, we're actually exposed not to individual chemicals, but to chemical mixtures. So for example, a very common uh, group, I suppose, of chemicals that are identified as having endocrine disruptor types of characteristics are pesticides. Well, of course, pesticides are not individual chemicals, but chemical mixtures. So we really should think of ourselves as being in a chemical soup. In addition to so-called synthetic or industrial types of chemicals that are manufactured, we also have to consider that certain types of chemicals in our world, we don't really think of as contaminants. They're actually present in plants. So phytoestrogens, for example, are naturally occurring chemicals with estrogenic properties. Um, we also have to consider our medications. So although we're taking medications such as oral contraceptives, hormone replacement, pills, etc., these, once our bodies are done with them, end up in our water supply. So they not only have impacts, environmental impacts for fish, but also can certainly contribute uh, to the exposure that we're experiencing. So definitely industrial chemicals are part of the discussion, but we also have to think of naturally occurring sources that come from food, as well as occupational exposures and uh, other types of exposures. So as I mentioned, I wanted to take a bit of a, an overview approach, although we are going to talk about some types of health impacts, especially during the perinatal health period. I also wanted to sort of build the argument of how the evidence is assessed, because I think that's very important in terms of why we usually come to the conclusion that we don't have a conclusion. So I'm going to use this very basic risk characterization model. First of all, just introducing the idea of how are we exposed to different types of chemical contaminants, the roots of exposure, basic fundamental injury models of cells, and uh, definitely the risks of adverse effects, both acute and late uh, onset. So I have this nice picture here of the big scary industrial plant. But we have to remind ourselves that different types of contaminant exposure are not just simply present in these types of occupational settings. If we picture, for example, an orchard or an agricultural farm, this is beautiful, this is outside, this is nice, sunny. But this is also the source of, in many cases, heavy pesticide application. So the workers, not only in the manufacture of particular chemicals, but also pesticide applicators who might work outside and away from such a stereotypical type of exposure plant, are also at risk. So we have an occupational exposure risk in terms of general contaminant exposure that is in usually much higher than the background population risk. And hopefully, we have certain types of regulatory standards that ensure that our workers 
have appropriate protective protective equipment, personal protective equipment, and this will ensure that they can mitigate some of their risks. We hope they have the education they need. We know, however, that across different industries, if we take the example of migrant workers, for example, who are pesticide applicators, many times might not have citizenship in the United States or Canada. They might have to purchase their own uh, personal protective equipment. This might sometimes not, uh, their workplace may not afford them the opportunity to change out of their soiled or contaminated work clothes. And this represents yet another exposure pathway, the take home pathway. So basically workers taking home their contaminated clothing to their families where it's laundered, but they might interact with children en route. Um, we also have to think of course that in addition to naturally occurring plant uh, types of estrogens, these uh, man-made or industrial types of chemicals do find their way into our environment, so air, soil, and water, as well as into our food supply. So there are many different types of exposure pathways, and of course this leads to specific policy implications. How do we set uh, regulatory standards, emission standards? How do we label our foods? Uh, with respect to organic foods or pesticide-free foods, and increasingly the occupational health and safety questions. So it's not enough that we have regulations. How do we ensure that the workers understand their rights as workers to uh, have uh, appropriate health and safety guidelines, that personal protective equipment is something that they can afford, but also that the take-home pathway and the health of their family is not at risk. So particularly for migrant workers who may have additional issues of language. So if uh, an American or Canadian company is using occupational health and safety guideline material in English, or in our case French, um, then this might not be suitable or appropriate if we have a Spanish-speaking uh, migrant population. So it's something to consider that we do see some inequities in terms of certain types of workers and their exposures. The classic routes of exposure are inhalation, ingestion, injection, and absorption. And if we remember our worker, he had a full body suit, mask, respirator, and gloves. And this is going, assuming he's not eating on the job, this is going to really protect him against most of these routes of exposure. But if we're interested in perinatal health, we have to add a few, including transplacental and lactation. So we're not only thinking simply about our classic routes of exposure that might include some preconception exposures to the moms and dads. We also have to think of the exposures in utero and of the neonate. So we use this model of cell injury to consider that when we talk about developmental health effects, when we talk about these types of problems, on a cellular basis, we're really talking about cells becoming injured. So disease is really just an injury or some sort of aberrant type of molecular um, signaling that is occurring at a cellular level. And so before our cells succumb and become irreversibly injured, they attempt in response to different types of cell stressors to cope or adjust or adapt to these types of cell stressors. And an important category of cell stressors, we have ex endogenous cell stressors, of course, are environmental types of stressors. So infectious pathogens, for example, a range of environmental contaminants, physical stressors, as well as nutritional imbalances. Too little food, too much food, the wrong types of food, etc. So when cells become injured, um, this can be manifested as changes to their metabolism, homeostasis, pH, etc. They might attempt to change their gene expression in an attempt to adapt to this physical type of stressor or environmental stressor, and they might change the shape of their cell or the number of cell in an attempt to prevent cell death. Is a general, more uh, tissue-related uh, process, toxicity, mutagenicity, teratogenicity, or of course endocrine disruption can lead to more disease-oriented states, pathophysiology, um, different types of inflammation, tumorogenesis, or what we're interested in today, abnormal development and endocrine disruption. In addition to the nature of the cell stressor, we also have to take into account the dose. So dose becomes a very complicated issue with respect to endocrine disruptors. So in most cases, I think most people have a general appreciation that if we take any type of substance at large enough quantities, it will in some way adversely affect us. Uh, 
So we use this relationship, the dose response curve, to essentially assume that increasing dose provides a greater response, in this case a response to some sort of disease or aberrant type of development. But what is becoming <coughs> increasingly obvious is that some types of chemicals, including endocrine disruptors, have non-characteristic, non-monotonic <coughs> dose response curves. So that we see not only effects at high concentrations of a particular dose, but also at low concentrations. And unfortunately, this has taken quite a lot of time. I mean, as people who work in toxicology really want to publish really good results, but you also want to have a, an effect. So if you start your dose response curve here, and you start at a nice high dose, you're probably going to see something, some sort of aberrant effect. It might be due to toxicity, but you're going to see something. If you go too low, you might be afraid you're not going to see something and you're not going to get your publication. So unfortunately, the toxicology data for very low doses is underrepresented. It's very difficult to look at these types of curves using humans because you need to, of course, expose your animals to serially increasing doses of a particular contaminant, which we don't do with people. In toxicology, we use very basic principles of exposure. This is a straightforward monotonic co curve, and we use these different effect levels, no observed uh, effect level and lowest observed effect level, to delineate what or how we can set a standard as to what would be a safe dose. So of course, um, here it looks like at 10 milligrams per kilogram, usually per day, we're not seeing anything. We are starting to see something at 18 milligrams per kilogram per day. We apply certain types of safety factors and extrapolate some sort of dose that regulatory agencies tell us is an acceptable or safe dose for humans to be exposed to. However, again, this is done using laboratory animals, so we have extrapolation question marks. And in many cases, it's done at the higher points of the curve. Um, it is not necessarily going to capture maybe some of the points over here at very low doses if those studies have not been completed. In terms of humans, the way that we can ascertain how humans might be uh, affected by environmental contaminants is biomonitoring. So just basically measuring chemicals and their metabolites in various tissue compartments. So commonly blood, urine, hair, and saliva. But again, if we're interested in any sort of reproductive or developmental health outcomes, we would add to this breast milk, amniotic fluid, cord blood, and follicular fluid. So depending on the tissue, this can be very difficult to collect. Most people are comfortable with hair, urine, and saliva. Very complicated to get blood samples. Follicular fluid is pretty much limited to IVF-related uh, procedures. So one has to think about the types of procedures, how invasive they are. Amniotic fluid in some studies has been collected through amniocentesis or at the time of amniocentesis. So certainly not everyone is volunteering to produce some of these tissues when we are looking at broad-based population studies. The next concept then, if we know that certain types of factors we have to consider as to whether or not it's biologically possible for our cells to be injured, we have to think of what are the characteristics of the exposure itself. So in terms of individual susceptibility, it's something I think that we are not quite there yet completely in terms of the endocrine disruption discussion with some of these components. We do have to think that although there might be widespread effects across a population of potential environmental contaminants, we do have to think that there might be some of us who might be uniquely susceptible on the basis of their pre-existing conditions. Age will talk about the critical windows of exposure, but age can also have another effect. When we think of as we get older, when we are exposed to chemicals, our liver has to detoxify some of these chemicals, our kidneys have to excrete. So if we get older and have reduced liver function or kidney function, we also may be more susceptible to contaminant exposures. Um, what is our lifestyle like? So what do we eat? High <coughs> mercury fish? Do we work in a, in a chemical producing plant? Um, what is our lifestyle and how might that relate to work? And then increasingly, um, in pharmacology, people are studying pharmacogenomics and trying to identify how people might be differentially sensitive 
to certain types of pharmaceuticals so that we can pinpoint which types of treatment might be best for cancer. We could do the same thing. We know that certain types of laboratory rodent strains have different sensitivities to endocrine disrupting chemicals. So you can't just take a bunch of strains of rats or mice and assume they're all going to equally present with reproductive toxicity. Some are actually resistant and do not show reproductive toxicity. So this suggests there's some sort of genetic difference in terms of the response. And this is probably to do with the metabolic enzymes um, and how they might be different. So we have to look at more understanding the strain related dis differences in the laboratory animals we study, but also what might be those differences in us, because this doesn't only tell us about how we will respond to environmental contaminants, it will also tell us how we respond to our pharmaceuticals. If they're in our body longer, do we eliminate them quickly? What's the half-life of the drug or the contaminant? Because to our body, they're pretty much the same thing. In terms of endocrine disruptors, there's many reasons why they're very perfect in terms of producing reproductive and developmental toxicity. First of all, they disrupt the endocrine system and reproduction and development are of course regulated by the endocrine system. So the classic pathways in many cases we use the term xenoestrogen meaning that in some way certain contaminants actually can activate steroid hormone receptors which act as transcription factors and regulate the expression of estrogen sensitive genes. And so we see bisphenol A or BPA that most people are familiar with, genistein, which is a plant estrogen, but also again, looking at the range of biochemical composition, here we have a metal, cadmium, which also can activate the estrogen receptor and of course our endogenous beta estradiol. We also in the last few years have identified uh, non-genomic steroid hormone receptors. So rather than acting as transcription factors, non-genomic steroid hormone receptors are located at cell surfaces and their effects are modulated by a signaling pathway. So the, di the discovery of different types of estrogen receptors, androgen receptors are also postulated, gives us a whole other set of mechanisms to explore in terms of how might different types of endocrine disruptors actually work inside our bodies. In addition, we know that endocrine disruptors can interfere with the synthesis and transport of hormones, epigenetic changes that I'll talk about in a bit, as well if we get the dose high enough, again, we see oxidative stress is just manifested as toxicity. On a physiological level, hormones are meant to communicate across the body. So they have local effects, but they also have widespread effects. So we know a very classic example of this is the HPG axis, so hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, which means, of course, that our brains are regulating what's going on in our gonads. So just as in the simple model of uh, how the HPG axis works, we see that estrogens are able to provide negative feedback and turn off hormone production at the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Well, just as estrogens can do this, anything that binds to the estrogen receptor can also do this. So this is a more physiological mechanism of how hypogonadism, for example, can be induced, induced by exposures to environmental contaminants. And this can be measured by circulating levels of FSH, LH, estrogens, or androgens in the male. In terms of risk of adverse effects, so definitely we need the potential when we're looking at perinatal, developmental or reproductive health effects, we need some sort of agent that is going to interact with the endocrine system, but timing and duration of exposure are also very important. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time here, but I think it is important, as we mentioned, preconception needs to be examined. So what are we bringing to the table before reproductive reproduction occurs. Now, of course, we know from many occupational studies, men, of course, can produce sperm all the time. We know that in some certain types of occupational settings, we see acute declines in sperm production, for example, welders and heat sources. They go on vacation. If they're gone long enough, sperm can come back up again. Men can do this, so in some cases, we can have acute and not necessarily chronic deficits in sperm production. Women, unfortunately, not the same thing. So eggs that are produced and uh, present from birth are going to be bathed in whatever chemical contaminants the woman is exposed to, um, but this also holds true for drugs, alcohol, etc. Perinatal exposure um, was already described a little bit, but just again, 
uh, depending on the timing of the exposure, depending on the nature of the, the so-called drug or, or teratogen, we can see uh, not really much, maybe just failure to implant if we're at the pre-implantation stage, major, major morphological abnormalities in the embryonic stage, and then more functional and maybe minor morphological abnormalities as we get later in the period. And this is the same for environmental contaminants, drugs, alcohol, smoking, et cetera. But also we have to extend this to the neonatal period as well because as we've already identified, lactation is an important route of exposure and certainly there's many developmental periods that are continuing post-birth. So I'm going to take a look at two specific contaminants that I think are, are very well studied as well as associated with particular um, types of effects. So bisphenol A usually has good name brand recognition. Uh, we have BPA labeling on many, many types of plastic wear, as in BPA-free. So I think this is a really great chemical that you can ask people about, and most people have heard now of BPA. And they ensure from the layperson on up that they try to buy plastic wear BPA-free, try not to heat plastics, etc. So it's a xenoestrogen. It's not as potent as others, but it does seem to have effects at low concentrations. Where do we get it? We get it from dust, we inhale it, we eat it, it's on our food, it's in the little cash receipts at the cash register, it's in the lining of our cans, bottles, etc., and it's in plastics. Phthalates is the other example because there's been some really remarkable studies that have linked phthalates to male-related reproductive or developmental toxicity. Um, the parent compound that is most generally examined is DEHP, but it's the metabolite, MEHP, that's actually creating the biological effects. And it's an anti-androgen, and as well, similar exposure patterns, makes plastics more f flexible, it's present in dust, and it's present in food. So when we look at the evidence, and again, I'm just gonna look at a very, very broad view. Um, laboratory animals, bisphenol A and phthalates are demonstrated reproductive toxicants. So we have more evidence probably at higher concentrations than lower. Ovulatory defects, I mean, again, I'm looking at preconception, so fertility, decreased semen quality, changes in testis histology, and infertility. In terms of population health reports, and in this case, we're looking at studies where they've attempted to do some biomonitoring, usually urine, and correlating endpoints, so time to pregnancy, uh, semen quality, male subfertility. Many of these types of studies, when you're looking at semen, are coming from uh, infertility clinics, so you have a little bit of additional bias there because these people have already identified that they're having problems. Uh, the Dutch, wonderful, amazing set of cohort studies there. So every man has to report for a uh, medical examination for military service at 18 and the scientists there have partnered and so they are able to capture everything from semen quality data, testis size, a lot of good male reproductive endpoints in those types of studies. In terms of biomonitoring, there are a couple of studies that have detected BPA and MEHP, again the phthalate metabolite in follicular fluid and it's present also in adult male and female urine. And in both of these cases, it's in the nanogram per milliliter type of range. In the perinatal postnatal period, you're looking at a couple of different biomonitoring areas. So amniotic fluid, cord blood, and maternal urine, and breast milk. So all of these uh, can be uh, put together and show a bit of a profile in terms of the fact that again, nanogram per milliliter exposure range and a number of different studies demonstrate that these chemicals, BPA and MEHP, can be detected. I'll do a shout out to Ty Arbuckle and Mandy uh, Fisher who uh, have worked on the MIRIC study, so we do have Canadian biomonitoring data. And uh, in terms of population health studies, Ty did a lot of work with the Farm Family Health Study. So looking at pesticide exposure in farm families and describing um, associations with spontaneous abortion and different types of birth defects. But really what is uh, very strong is the reproductive and developmental toxicity in, again, laboratory animals. So we can demonstrate a range of chemical exposures more at the high end than the low end. Um, in terms of numbers of studies, but spontaneous abortion, and very classic types of male urogenital birth defects. 
that we'll talk about in a moment. So again, if we think about what is the role of these estrogenic or anti-androgenic chemicals, they are disrupting normal male development. So the effects on boys tend to be more pronounced. So in putting all of this together, it's very difficult to look at one study. When I pulled together some nanogram per milliliter studies, in many cases, this is a range of usually one to 10 nanograms per milliliter, depending on blood, um, amniotic fluid, follicular fluid, et cetera. In many cases, these are one-off studies. In some cases, the populations weren't very large. Um, so we can look at, you really have to look at the weight of a large number of studies, and the National Toxicology Program has done this for us. So if we look at bisphenol A exposure, they've used the microgram per kilogram body weight per day, which is how we talk about it in laboratory animals. And here I think someone was mentioning that we should be talking about the, the, uh, the pros of breastfeeding. So we see that formula-fed infants, for example, have much higher um, BPA exposure compared to breastfed infants. And you might be looking at the next number, six to 12 months, why is that the same? There's a lot of assumptions that are gonna go into this kind of data. So the assumption being after six months, for some breastfed infants, their formula supplemented, and that there's starting to be the introduction of food. And food, in many cases, still comes in prepared packaged materials that it increases the exposure. And again, for infants and uh, children, dust is also another route. Adults have uh, much lower per body weight uh, exposures. So if we look at the National Toxicology uh, Program Center at the weight of all of the evidence, so looking at many, many, many of the reproductive and developmental toxicity studies in laboratory animals, they are looking at very, very clear developmental toxicity at the high dose range very, some evidence of adverse effects in terms of reproductive, so this is more infertility, fertility types of outcomes. The low dose, as I said, there's less studies. So definitely we have some studies that very clearly demonstrate effects. Other studies do not show effects of bisphenol A at a low dose range. So this is how we have to put all of this evidence together and say that certainly at the high dose, we're talking hundreds of milligrams per kilogram per day, there seems to be something. At the lower dose, is not to say that it won't be something, but there's just not enough studies out there to be conclusive. And in terms of low dose, they were looking at the micrograms per kilogram <coughs> per day. For humans, for humans looking through all of the data on humans, um, as was mentioned, there is concern about the developmental toxicity for the fetus, infants, and children, for the brain. Um, also other behavioral characteristics, minimal concern in terms of mammary gland, and again, estrogens are related to development of breast cancer, so early puberty, there have been a couple of studies from specific areas of the world with extraordinary xenoestrogen exposures and precocious puberty at very, very young ages. This isn't something that has been widespread, however. Um, more negligible concern for just general reproductive toxicity and the gross endpoints of perinatal health, so just mortality, birth defects, reduced birth weight, or growth of the fetus. If we look at phthalates, however, the situation is a bit different. Phthalates, again, we see the same sort of pattern. Breastfeds are a little bit higher, and again, just the idea that it's a little bit, uh, the assumption, maybe these assumptions in some cases are wrong, but this is the assumptions they go into this with that uh, the breastfed infants are not as full and have to be supplemented a bit more with food. And again, the phthalate exposure comes from food as opposed to uh, the formula fed uh, infants. And uh, definitely see higher levels in the children as opposed to adults. So where it becomes a little bit scary is serious concern. So this is a body that has, again, National Toxicology Program, has looked at all of the evidence for all the human studies out there, and including biomonitoring data, and have identified critically ill male infants. Why them? So again, I've already alluded to the fact that if we're talking about mechanisms of action that in some way prevent the normal masculinization, we're gonna see more pronounced effects on boys. But in addition to that, what is a critically male infant exposed to? A lot of plastic. And so obviously the more short-term outcome is to make sure this little guy will survive. Uh, 
However, in the interim, lots of plastic exposure from tubing, from plastics, etc. So because of this, the exposure profile is estimated to be upwards of 6,000 micrograms per kilogram per day. So we do have to identify, and this would be interesting, obviously some little infant who is critically ill in the NICU or PICU is already going to have some adverse uh, developmental challenges moving forward. But it would be nice to see what are the late onset types of adverse effects that may occur, what is their fertility profiles. We just don't have that data. Um, all of our potential risk groups here they've identified are boys. So male infants, there's some concern. Again, the offspring of women undergoing certain types of medical procedures. So again, increased plastics exposure, male offspring, male children. So all of this seems to point to ideas that there is some level of concern to, again, more serious concern for critically male infants. So in laboratory animals, a specific syndrome has been named after phthalates, so the phthalate syndrome. And this is this cluster, I've mentioned a few times now, the urogenital malformations. So they include cryptorchidism, or the failure for the testes to descend, hypospadias, or the incorrect positioning of the urethra, and a very interesting uh, and very typically found in only animals until recently endpoint called reduced anogenital distance. So if we pretend this is an animal, not a human, this distance is a sexually dimorphic characteristic. So as you can see, it's supposed to be much greater, about two times greater in boys versus girls. And this has been a very, deter a very uh, acceptable uh, approach to sex very young animals to determine boys or girls, male or female. And again, it's been a very reliable endpoint to determine exposure to estrogens and particular phthalates during perinatal development. So uh, researcher Swan came along and decided to try and use this endpoint in humans. She also determined that human prenatal phthalate exposure was correlated with reduced anogenital distance. So this is really one of the first papers um, that looked at anogenital distance as a particular endpoint for humans. So there's a lot of pros and cons, a lot of discussion, and this gets into how do we put all this evidence together? Um, do we know what is the normal anogenital distance? She had uh, a couple of studies. The second one had a large enough population to show, again, the shift in the uh, position of, uh, in the normal range of anogenital distance, as well as shorter penile length, cryptorchidism again, undescended testis, and another study, Latini, showed a shorter gestational age of birth. So these are only a few studies. But certainly, anogenital distance is now sort of earmarked as an interesting endpoint to follow up on. And then finally, we get to this idea of what might be the risks for late onset adverse effects. So the developmental origin of health and disease model. So this idea that some sort of exposure during perinatal period can somehow influence the onset of later diseases. And later, I'm talking about maybe childhood, usually adult, I think, when most people talk about it. But I think we could consider, in some cases, childhood to be also important. So one of the, the main models that people propose is epigenetics, of course. So for those of you who aren't aware, this is a change in gene expression without a change in the DNA sequence. So a couple of different mechanisms, <laughs> methylation or histone modifications. So methylation, for example, is something that when a chemical exposure adds this methyl group, then the gene in that region, if the methyl group is in the right area, will not be expressed. So this changes how the DNA is, is read, how the genes that we have in our genome are expressed, even if we don't have a mutation. And what's very interesting is that these methylation marks have been demonstrated to be heritable. So they're present not only in the first generation, but the second, the third, and in some cases, the fourth. So many, this is a very hot area in environmental health, many endocrine disruptors have been demonstrated uh, to have to induce epigenetic changes. Perhaps the most interesting in terms of generational effects, 
has been diethylstilbestrol, which is a very potent estrogen back in the days where they thought giving drugs to help pregnancy was a good thing. Um, this, of course, produced significant uh, onset of vaginal and testicular cancer in the sons of DES-exposed moms, but they're also seeing effects in now the grandchildren as well. So these um, effects have been carried through to different generations. Uh, bisphenol A, phthalates, just to continue the trend, but I introduce a couple of uh, herbicides, uh, methoxychlorine, vaclosline, antiandrogens, and uh, they were in a landmark uh, paper by Skinner and Anway that really showed that exposure to the first generation still had effects on testis histology and semen quality in the fourth generation. So a generation in which they're not directly part of the exposure cycle. So this is just generation after generation. And of course, epigenetics has been proposed as the model for late onset disease, cancer, obesity, et cetera. The other thing to consider when we talk about late onset disease, I think, that is fairly well elucidated as a model. It was first proposed by Skaken back in 2001 and really building again on that Dutch cohort. So the idea that they have a really lot of great data coming out of Norway, Sweden, as well as Denmark. He worked in Denmark to show that when men presented for military service, they could collect a rich collection of data. The benefit is these are on uh, these are just general population guys. So these are not men who are going to the fertility center because they suspect a problem. So you could really see what might be the effects in a population. And so he proposed this model that maybe the birth defects that I was described with the phthalate syndrome, so cryptorchidism and hypospadias, were somehow related to semen quality, were somehow related to apparently increasing rates of testicular cancer. So testicular cancer starts to increase, is presented as a young adult cancer around late teens, early 20s. So the model goes like this. Environmental factors such as endocrine disruptor somehow cause aberrations in the testis. So how the testis works in a phys as a physiological organ, which produces sperm and of course steroid hormones like androgens. We can also have genetic relationships, so there can be a predisposition to certain men who might have a specific karyotypes or mo might already have point mutations, might also be predisposed to some of these phenomenons. So the testicular dysgenesis induced by environmental exposures changes Sertoli cells. Sertoli cells are the cells in the testis that are responsible for sperm production. And so this means we get reduced semen quality. So this, of course, uh, is infertility or subfertility. But we also start to see carcinoma in situ and the formation of testicular cancer. So these two endpoints, sperm quality and uh, testicular cancer, of course, are not neonatal endpoints. So we are not measuring these until post-puberty. So this is a late onset that is, again, proposed to result from perinatal exposure to endocrine disruptors. On the hormone side of things, the Leydig cells are responsible for producing uh, androgens and other steroid hormones. And so we also see decreased Leydig cell function, so less androgens to support sperm production. And of course, less androgens also means uh, the aberrant masculinization of the fetus. So hypospadias, again, the improper placement of the urethra and the failure of the testes to descend or cryptorchidism. And again, cryptorchidism can be bilateral or unilateral. One testis fails to descend or both. And testis failure to descend by itself <coughs> is a risk factor for infertility as well. It is a relatively common uh, congenital anomaly. Finally, if we look at other types of endpoints that may be related to perinatal health endpoints, and again, arguably neurodevelopmental disorders, as was already discussed, it might be part of the ongoing phenomenon, uh, but in many cases, so this might be the same syndrome that has already started in the perinatal neonatal period, but we are only able to examine and diagnose in the later childhood period. So arguably whether this is a late onsite, onset uh, disorder or set of disorders, but certainly there have been review studies that have looked at the many hundreds now of studies that have examined biomonitoring for certain types of uh, endocrine toxicant exposures and autism spectrum disorder, or ADHD, 
And although there's good studies and bad studies, and this is why you have to take this very large, robust look at things, um, the good studies and bad studies, even if we take away the methodological issues, the bulk of the uh, analysis still demonstrated there seems to be a positive association between environmental exposures and ASD or ADHD. Puberty is, of course, a, an important developmental endpoint, although we think of the critical windows of exposures as the perinatal period, the early neonatal period. Puberty also is a developmental period where the body is undergoing changes. So andronarch or menarche are these two points the onset of male or female puberty, respectively. And in some cases, we see as well uh, associations with exposure to endocrine disruptors delaying or um, increasing this, the initiation of puberty in uh, girls. And then finally, obesity is an endpoint that is increasingly a public health concern uh, as a potential risk factor by itself for cancer, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, et cetera. So several different studies have demonstrated associations between prenatal exposure and later childhood BMI, um, as well as showing correlation between maternal obesity, perinatal exposures, uh, and the uh, later the girl's BMI. But what's very interesting, rather than looking at individual studies, is this very large European Union study that has just come to a close, so I think we can expect very many interesting papers. The Obelix Project, Obesogenic Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals Linking Prenatal Exposure to the Development of Obesity Later in Life. So this is essentially what you want. This is a European Union initiative. This includes many different longitudinal cohort studies in many European um, areas, both uh, so-called developed countries, uh, different types of exposure profiles depending on the nature of the country and geography, etc. So I think we're going to be very interested to see um, some of these types of studies. There's also, it's a very interdisciplinary initiative. There's also laboratory studies as part of this as well. So we're going to see profiles of individual country exposure data as well as across many European country exposure data. So what do we need moving forward? Because I think that's sort of a little bit of the goal for today to I identify emerging areas of research and also to learn how to work together. So definitely interdisciplinary teams is, is critical because yes, we need all the toxicology and laboratory studies. We also need all the epidemiological biomonitoring types of studies but we also need to talk to each other and importantly as it's already been raised we have to talk to the general public as well. We also have to consider it's not up here but when we talk about the existence of different types of contaminants in body tissues that kind of sounds scary. So how do you tell a woman that she has contaminants in her breast milk? I mean regardless of how much or what the effects might be she might feel contaminated. So we have to be able to have a, di a discussion of how do we translate biomonitoring data in an ethically responsible way. There's been a lot of disasters that have happened with our Aboriginal communities with respect to breastfeeding and different types of contaminant monitoring. How do we responsibly discuss this? But also, how do we put it into context? Because yes, we do seem to be ubiquitously exposed to many different contaminants. Are they having an effect? In, on an individual basis, um, what does it translate for your individual risk? That part we can't answer on an individual case-by-case -case basis. So we do need to find the language to talk about some of this. We need prospective studies. So critically male infants, for example, what happens to them assuming they get over whatever they were hospitalized for the, in the first place? Um, we need lots of biomonitoring and be able to archive different types of samples across the lifespan. But we also have to recognize that different risks might occur, so we, we have to make sure we have a very diverse sample of biomonitoring data. So both race and ethnicity, but also different socioeconomic strata, different regions as well. We have to identify biomarkers, so it would be nice to have a, a, perhaps a metabolic enzyme biomarker, something that tells us somebody has had a cumulative exposure over their lifetime or something that maybe is just very specific to very early exposures. So if we don't happen to sample your mother, you still know what your early exposure might have been.
Um, again, I think it's going to be ongoing. This personalized approach to pharmaceuticals will probably also drive a personalized approach to identifying how we metabolize drugs, but also contaminants as well. And are there some of us, we talk about the risks for adverse health effects. Some of us might actually be protected by our genetic polymorphisms with respect to how we process chemical contaminants. So it'd be nice to identify those. And how do we translate so-called rodent endpoints or laboratory endpoints to humans? So the intergenital distance is a very novel idea to translate something we've only really measured or talked about in rodents to humans. For those of you in clinical practice, and we've already started to talk about this, I mean, we could start by just taking and being aware of which patients have an occupational exposure or have a higher than average exposure because of some unique feature of their job or their hobbies or their dietary intakes and see if there is a correlation. Even if there is, uh, there isn't a particular fix other than to treat and diagnose and manage the reproductive or developmental abnormality. Use a precautionary principle. For lack, of a, for lack of really anything else that we can tell them, we can certainly tell patients to avoid any unnecessary contaminant exposure. So if you don't have to, a lot of, there's been a huge trend as women um, have had later pregnancies, a lot of gray hairs are starting to show because a lot of women are not dyeing their hair during pregnancy. And, and this is a choice, and this is a choice that perhaps might reduce some chemical exposure that may be perceived as not essential um, during pregnancy. In terms of information, as was already mentioned, the internet is a kind of veritable zoo of good and bad. There's a lot of bad. Uh, how, do you, how do you talk about that information? Well, we obviously need tools. We need evidence-based guidelines um, on really what we can do. Uh, there might be little that an individual can do, but barring that, we still have to live in the chemical soup, and we still have to read newspaper articles that might scare us to death if we're contemplating pregnancy or if we are pregnant that says that we have certain types of contaminants in our, in our bodies. But also, we can't ignore the fact there's a lot of high probability risks out there that we already know do cause severe effects, uh, infectious disease, drugs, alcohol, smoking, congenital anomalies in the mom before pregnancy, obesity, as well as just SES risks. So yes, we want to focus on environment. We want to be able to respectfully respond to questions. But we also want to make sure that a lot of the SES and personal risks, like intimate partner violence, are not ignored along the way. And these perhaps are topics for other different types of forms. But the idea is that in many cases, higher probability risks might be something that people can work on a little bit uh, going into a pregnancy um, and have a little bit more personal control and a lot of, of potentially good outcome that certainly would perhaps mitigate some of the interactions with even low levels contaminant exposure. So that's it for me. Thank you.